you so much. All right, a couple of other things at the top. Um, I wanted to make sure that you all saw the announcement uh, this afternoon from the Treasury Department that as of today, they've dispersed approximately 90 million economic impact payments, which are of course the checks, but most of which are going through direct deposit, totaling more than $242 billion following last week's signing of the rescue plan. This is a key down payment toward the president's announcement on Monday that 100 million payments would be sent in 10 days. So we'll have, we'll continue to update you as we progress. Uh, then um, the Violence Against Women's Women Act, as you all know, is being uh, considered uh, in Congress today. Uh, he, uh, the, it is one of the, pres the original fasting, I should say, is one of the president's proudest accomplishments. Uh, the president applauds the House of Re Representatives, which will vote today to pass the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2021 with bipartisan, expected bipartisan support and with important improvements to increase safety and service services for all survivors. Reauthorizing VAWA is a priority for the president, and he urges the Senate to also come together in a bipartisan manner to ensure swift passage of VAWA so that he can sign it into law soon. With that, Darlene, go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Uh, first question, is there any reaction from the White House to Russia recalling its ambassador to the U.S.? They didn't give a specific reason for that move, but... It comes after a number of Russia-related developments. Uh, well, we've certainly seen those reports. Um, I would say that um, you know the uh, our administration is going to take a different approach in our relationship to Russia than the prior administration. Obviously, the president spoke to this during an interview uh, that he conducted just last night, uh, and we are uh, going to be uh, straightforward and we are going to be direct in areas where we have concerns. Uh, as you know, there is an ongoing review uh, and um, the president has, well, we have announced key conclusions from an intelligence community assessment on the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. Uh, we have, there's an ongoing review of other areas where we have ongoing concerns. At the same time, we have areas where we believe we can work together. Obviously the signing of New START is an example of that. Addressing nuclear proliferation is an example of that. And uh, we, we hope that there is opportunity there, but our relationship will look different. We will be direct. We will speak out on areas where we have concerns and it will certainly be, uh, and, and as the president said last night, uh, certainly the uh, Russians will be held accountable for the actions that they have taken. We'll have more on that soon. You mentioned the interview last night. Uh, the president was asked whether the vice president is the last person in the room with him before decisions, and he responded that most of the time, yes, as a practical matter, yeah, she is. And what then he went on to say for, for, for the full context of the interview that she's traveling around the country and referenced the fact that she uh, yesterday was in Denver, Colorado, the day before was in Las Vegas, Nevada, that she has been out there working her heart out, uh, communicating with the American people. So obviously when she's on the road, she's not the person always last in the room uh, by practicality, uh, but otherwise uh, she she certainly is. Go ahead. Uh, uh, question about the situation on the border. It's now been three weeks since I think in this room you were first asked about uh, getting us some, some press access. Why have mm -hmm. we still not seen any images inside these facilities? We remain committed to doing that. And I think uh, the, these facilities are overseen. HHS, of course, overseas, uh, oversees the shelters. Uh, the uh, DHS oversees the Border Patrol facilities. And uh, we want to work with them to ensure we can do it, respecting the privacy uh, and uh, obviously the health protocols required by COVID. But even given COVID protocols and obviously privacy concerns, you know, even you all haven't released any images that you obviously could, could redact if you wanted to. Again, we, we remain committed to sharing with all of you uh, data on the number of kids crossing the border, the steps we're taking, the work we're doing to open up facilities, uh, our own bar we're setting for ourselves and improving the and expediting the timeline and uh, the uh, the treatment of, of these children. And we remain committed to transparency. I don't have an update for you on the timeline for access, but it's certainly something we support. On this. You know, we're hearing from border agents that they're frustrated that they can't show us what's actually happening along the border. They can't do ride-alongs. They can't answer questions about what's happening inside. It certainly seems like there's an element of secrecy here. Why? I, I certainly wouldn't characterize it that way. I know there's Border Patrol agents quoted in a lot of your stories and you speak to frequently, and that's something we support. It's obviously there's a long tradition of coordinating with Department of Homeland Security, but uh, if we are, if our, if our policy is, is, is 
keeping people quiet. We are not successful and it is not our policy uh, to prevent people from talking. And just on one other topic, um, I wonder if you can explain a little bit the IRS's decision to delay the, the tax filing deadline by a month of What's the, the hope of the impact of this? Sure. I know we've seen some of those reports. Uh, I don't believe it's been confirmed or finalized quite yet. Um, so uh, I will let the IRS make their final decisions. And then uh, if, if that is what moves forward, we're happy to speak to it. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. I just kind of want to pick up on uh, sure. Mary's questioning over there. Is uh, the White House or DHS instructing border agents to refuse ride-along requests from reporters? Because that's what a lot of our folks on the ground are hearing. Again, I think we've seen, uh, watching a number of the reports you all do, a number of Border Patrol uh, officials who are quoted in them, who are up here in them, and certainly from the White House, we support that. It's coordinated through the Department of Homeland Security, and I'd point you to them for any additional questions about the logistics of press access. But our, I mean, our reporters used to be able to get ride-alongs during the Trump administration, mm -hmm. and you all came in and promised to be the most truthful and transparent administration and, and you all you know oversee the Department of Homeland Security. So if you all wanted to grant access to the press, couldn't you just tell DHS to do it? Again, we fully support transparency and I would encourage you to talk to the Department of Homeland Security about any requests you have for press access or uh, what you're looking to ac uh, accomplish at the border. Okay, oh, oh, one good. question, and you know one of the biggest criticisms of the Trump administration's remain in Mexico policy was that it overwhelmed all these border towns in Mexico and created pretty dangerous living conditions for these migrants. And so now you have the exact same thing happening. Even though you all have reversed, rescinded that policy, these border towns are overwhelmed and the president is saying, do not come. So how is the situation on the ground in Mexico any different? Well, the situation on the ground is certainly challenging in part because we inherited a dismantled system that wasn't prepared for uh, processing asylum requests um, that had left in place um, uh, the Remain in Me Mexico program where uh, people were in a camp that was um, did not have the conditions that we felt. Up. Well, I, I think what I'm conveying to you is that we are less than 60 days, about 60 days in. Uh, we are working to uh, re to repair what has been an unprepared and dismantled system. It's going to take some time. Uh, our policy is that we're obviously going to um, continue to um, uh, uh, make sure we're working through our laws um, and the border is not open. But we also, uh, as you know, have, um, have changed our policy to approach it in a more humane way and keep kids safe. And uh, that requires uh, putting in place more effective and efficient processing at the border. It's going to take some time. We're working through it. Every day we have uh, new steps and new improvements we're taking to make the system more efficient and effective. So is there a limit or a cap to the number of unaccompanied minors that are going to be allowed into the U.S.? A limit or a cap? Should, so should we send some kids who are 10 back at a certain point? Is that what you're asking me? I'm, I'm not setting the policy here. I'm just asking you what the Biden administration's policy is. Is there a limit to the number of, of children that will be allowed in? I mean, the numbers we're hearing now, 565 on average every day. I, I'm just curious what the what the end game is here, how many ultimately would be allowed in? Well, I think where, where we are is we're focused on some of the very specific numbers. So uh, when we came into office, um, there existed about 13,000 permanent beds in HHS or permanent and influx shelter system facilities uh, during the last administration. Thousands of these beds, approximately half were taken offline due to COVID. Staffing was also reduced to put it on par uh, with the new reduced cap capacity. Uh, this was sufficient for the prior, prior administration. This is how we got here because they were expelling children in addition to families and single adults. We decided, as you all know, that we will be more humane about how we approach this. Uh, there was an operational capacity built. Uh, the prior administration also did not consider that there were other mitigation efforts like masking, improved ventilation, cohorting, and other measures that would contain the spread of COVID. There's now revised CDC guidance, which means there's greater capacity in these facilities where we can expedite children, uh, expedite getting children into them. Uh, there are We are taking steps to ensure that when kids come to the border, we look and see if they have a phone number in their pocket so we can call the family member and get them to those family members as quickly as possible. These are the steps uh, that we're taking at this point in time. Our policy continues to be, we're not gonna send a 10 year old back across the border. That was the policy of the last administration. That's not our policy here. Go ahead. Is the, if unintentionally in your commitment to mm -hmm. keep these young, uh, these children under 17 or 17 under safe, 
if unintentionally, is the U.S. government incentivizing parents to send their children across the border alone because that is their best chance to enter and stay in the United States? Well, that certainly you've heard the president say in this interview that he conducted that he uh, is encouraging people not to come. Now is not the time to come. This is not a safe journey for people to take of any age. And he believes, as he talked about last night, that uh, no parent is looking and just trying to make a bet uh, on whether their kid can kind of make it. This is a very difficult and treacherous journey. Most of these kids are fleeing uh, very challenging circumstances. And his view is that there's a number of steps we need to take and steps that he hopes he can work with Democrats and Republicans on. So that's his goal. How's that message communicated to the fact we heard him obviously mm -hmm. in the interview? How is that message being communicated by the U.S. government to those thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, who are already in the midst of this dangerous journey that they're making to the border right now, and they are not receiving that message? The thousands of children or the thousands of families? Children, families, adults, all of them, all the in-between that our teams from Telemundo and other reporters on the ground are meeting. Well, we convey with every official that speaks. Ali Mayorkas, uh, Secretary Ali Mayorkas did an interview just yesterday. Uh, we've heard, you've heard Roberta Jacobson speak to this and a range of officials beyond them who are speaking directly with countries, working in partnership with them, speaking directly through channels that are in the region, that now is not the time to come. The border is not open. This is a treacherous journey. The vast majority of people will be certainly sent back uh, on their journey. And that's the message we're sending. I guess that it seems maybe it's a mixed message that's received right now, but initially Alejandro Mayorka said, don't come now, mm -hmm. right? And then we heard from the president saying, don't come, the U.S. is in the process of setting up this system so that in your own home country, you can apply for asylum. Yeah. So, so how, how do you, yeah. it appears to be a mixed message or it's received as a mixed message, which is don't come now, come later, and others don't come at all. Well, I think this is a no doubt a complicated circumstance. And what we are trying to do is address this in, uh, an effective and humane manner. And uh, that requires uh, putting in place additional policies and measures. You referenced one of them, which is reinstituting the uh, the uh, CAM program, which would allow kids to apply uh, from their home country. That is certainly a positive, an option. And how long would it take that's available to them? We are hoping that can be uh, happen soon. I don't have an exact timeline for you, but it, we uh, we would like to put that back in place. It was a program that was already in place and was ended in 2017. So that's an example. We want to build uh, on beyond that so we can have programs where it, it ensures that kids are not taking this difficult journey, that they have other choices and other options. But I was also, and this will take some more time, but we're, we're going to keep seeing these cycles, which we've seen. This is not the first cycle, 2014, 2018. These numbers have been increasing since April of 2020 of last year. Unless we work together, Democrats and Republicans, to address the root causes, there have been policies and bills 